figured I'd give a short talk about a package that I've been working on with a handful of people, and also tell you about another project, uh, which is the larger context for, for this. So TestDAP is a package that uh, is meant for unit testing any kind of tabular data. And for most of my career, I've worked with small data sets. Um, someone that lives in the area, I hear about people just constantly talking about big data. But a lot of good insights just actually exist in small data. But um, a constant challenge of dealing with CSV files is making sure um, your data are for formatted correctly. Um, and it's a very, very tedious process. Um, Owen gave a talk this morning about um, getting a whole bunch of undergraduates to just check files constantly to make sure uh, the data look correct, uh, there's nothing weird going on. But if you're going to do that for tons of CSV files, it's going to be very, very tedious, and you're very likely to make a mistake. Um, most of data science really is spending a whole bunch of time cleaning up data. Um, it takes a while before you actually get to analyze the fun part. And so um, what we did um, is basically do something which is a programmatic implementation of what used to be Google Refine, which is now an open source project called Open Refine. And the idea is that we could just do unit testing, uh, but for data. And the way we would do that would work exactly like unit testing for code. We would write expectations uh, for the different columns in your data set and actually make sure it works um, either on a single CSV file or several CSV files. So um, what it really allows you to do is define expectations and be able to detect from fairly large CSV files whether you're actually missing data, uh, are they missing for a reason, uh, whether they're incorrect uh, NAs uh, that were entered manually by somebody, uh, whether there's uh, weird encoding going on with your data, things like that. Um, but also figure out when there's interesting things happening with your data itself. Um, are the outliers because of uh, human mistakes, or they actually are actual things that are happening in your data sets? And um, most importantly, we wanted a way to just write these tests one time and then let them work on new data as you got them. So if you set up a whole bunch of expectations for your data, you could just keep adding data files and then um, be notified immediately when something goes wrong. So um, what kinds of things can you do? You can set up, um, for example, um, a, a, sampling, a sampling scheme for your uh, study uh, and, and look for um, data that match that scheme. So for example, if you're working on an experiment, um, where there was data collected once an hour. You can actually test for that at CSV files that are several thousand rows long or several million rows long. Uh, you can look for missing data, uh, especially if you're not expecting things to be missing. Um, if you're working with any kind of geographic data, a lot of the time you'll be working with, say, ants in Madagascar, and then there'll be 100 rows where everything is sitting in South America. Something went wrong systematically within that set of within that section of your data. We can detect things like that. Um, mangled strings, people often just abbreviate species names, misspell species names, and you'll end up with multiple um, uh, individuals when you're actually expecting the same. So um, it works uh, in a fairly simple way, um, just like uh, you would write a test to, to say, I'm expecting this to happen. So in this case, I'm creating um, uh, a data frame that um, somebody might have manually entered from data collected in the field. You can see somebody entered an NA, which is actually just a character. Uh, on, under name, there's an NAA, which is actually not a standard representation for NA. And biologists have a horrible habit of using uh, 999 or negative 9999 as a way to indicate NAs. Um, if you have this sort of crappy data, what can you do? Um, and especially if you have to work through hundreds of data files, hundreds of CSV files. So this is one possible expectation. You can just say, find poorly formatted NAs in this data set. Um, and the output can be um, multiple kinds of output. In this case, it actually just gives you an index of the rows and columns where it's detected these NAs. Um, you can see that it hasn't picked up the NAA because that's not a standard variation of, of an NA. But, um, 
you can then go through and fix this by just saying fix the NAs, but in this case you notice there's an additional variation uh, which is the NAA, and you can go ahead and add a regular expression uh, or other types that you might expect. But this is just one really trivial use case uh, for what you might do. Um, and of course, um, when you do a unit test on code, you just get an error, and then you have to go back and fix it. Because um, in this case, um, it's, the errors are fairly standard, you can actually clean them as well, and then get back a data set um, where the columns are all uh, the same uh, data format, and they're not multiple formats mixed together. So in this previous example, you have a whole bunch of numbers, and then you have an NA, so it, it just becomes a character vector. Um, once you've fixed it, and you look at the class in that particular column, it ends up back as numeric. Um, you can also write any type of custom expectation for the type of data you might work with, so we've set it up just like any unit testing framework. And so this is an example of a complete test to look for NAs. And so um, we're reading through a whole bunch of CSV files sitting in a directory, testing for NAs, and then throwing up a warning or error if it detects uh, poorly formed NAs in any of them. So you can imagine having a full file of these tests and just working through directories and directories of uh, data. And you can quickly detect problems and then go through and fix them. Uh, we can read files up to 20 gigs um, fairly quickly. Um, and right now, the project uh, or this package is in alpha, but we expect to have something on CRAM uh, within a month or so. So if you actually have um, really ugly data that you want us to work with as use cases, please feel free to send them our way. Um, the last thing that we're trying to do is actually help you visualize and detect systematic problems across CSV files using a tool called Lens. So if any of you have been to eLife, it's a journal. Um, eLife actually has a, a tool called Lens that helps you um, look at content on the web in a completely different way. And Lens is just a standalone web component that can take either XML or JSON. And the test stack package can actually spit out JSON if you want it to. And every time you apply a certain unit test on one or more files, it can actually visualize hotspots where there are problems. So in this case, you can imagine, it's hard to see the contrast right here, but you can imagine if this was actually uh, several thousand lines of uh, CSV, that there's something weird going on in that green block. And if you see that pattern across multiple files, you can just imagine that something horribly went wrong uh, with the person that you hired during that time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for the rest of my uh, talk, I'm just gonna give you a larger context of the project that I work in. So I work in a project called R Open Sci, we primarily work with R because those are the communities of scientists that we interact with. And we're trying to bring a culture of open science and help them actually interact with data on the web, make their work reproducible, but without a lot of effort. Um, and the reason why we do this is because scientists have this twisted notion that if they do a really complicated study with a lot of funding, and if they put out a couple of papers, they're done with their job. Um, they don't realize that um, the paper is just an advertisement for all the scholarship that went in. It's the data, it's the code, uh, it's an, any algorithm that they developed during that time. And so we're trying to get people away from this mindset and start sharing every part of that process that went into generating that paper. Um, but the way we're doing science is also changing. When I was a graduate student, I collected all of my own data, I ran all my own experiments, but to most of my postdocs, I actually relied on data sets that, are, that already exist. Um, and if any of you have read Tony Hayes' book on the fourth paradigm, there's a lot of talk about us being the sort of this fourth paradigm, which is data intensive science. And so um, when people collect data and they don't put the data anywhere afterwards, they're lost. And when people query data off the web, they don't actually tell you what they've done to it before they analyze it. So ultimately, you end up with this giant black box, and we're trying to change that black box. Um, Christopher talked about Reinhard Rogoff this morning. It's a very, very silly case where uh, an Excel error led to um, uh, an issue that was discovered two years after publication. So if you share data and code, it's very likely somebody will spot an issue fairly early on. But um, catching mistakes early on is really not a final motivation. It's really to do better science. Um, if you are a statistical modeler, it's good for us to give you data to build better, better models. 
And um, as someone that collects my own data, or used to collect my own data, having better models helps me decide what kind of data to collect. <coughs> and so um, we're trying to push people into that top right-hand quadrant. And so the project that I work on is, is called Art of Inside. And we do four different things. We have tools that help people grab data off the web from repositories, uh, from non-repositories. We help uh, people access full text. Uh, thanks to Martin Fenner over there, we can actually get every field and every article published in PLOS. Um, we can get, um, uh, we can visualize the kinds of data that we pull down from these different sources. And then we have a whole bunch of other tools in which test that falls under, which can help with reproducibility. So we can integrate with Git. Uh, we're hoping to integrate with Max's DAP very soon. And so, um, we have about 60 or so of our packages that do various things. Obviously, I'm not going to go through them, but uh, at that URL, you can find um, tutorials and more detailed information about these packages. But I can give you a sense of what they do. Um, we talk to a whole bunch of museums, and you can get uh, several hundred million uh, occurrence records. Uh, with PLOS, we can get every field from over 100,000 articles. And we can actually go and grab data sets from any article that deposited their data in Dryad, which is a repository uh, that more than 200 journalists talk to. And um, because we primarily deal with people that are not programmers, uh, they write a little bit of R code to put a model here and there, we try to simplify things for them. So um, in this case, we load up a couple of libraries. We've got a DOI for a paper. And we can retrieve this data in one go. And because um, R is programmatic, sorry, R is vectorized, that can be replaced by an entire column read from a CSV file with, say, a thousand identifiers, and you would still only need these four lines of code to get a thousand data sets back. Um, we can get uh, other kinds of interesting data if you're uh, into, for example, natural resource economics. We can get uh, commercial fishing data for every species of fish from every country in the world since 1950 until now uh, with just these lines of code. Um, in this case, I've limited this to four species of fish that are very, very interesting, and they crash differently and move at the same time in opposite hemispheres, and you can easily link that to climate change. But this is not uh, pseudo code. You can actually just copy and paste this, and this will all work just fine. Uh, we can get uh, climate data from the IPCC. We can actually get any particular model that you think uh, is valid. We can get composite data. We can get projections for any region in the world for any period of time in the past or the future. In this case, I've said European Basin from 2080 to 2100. So you can imagine that you can pull down interesting in data, pull down uh, some kind of predictor variable, in this case temperature, and actually model um, some process that I might find interesting. Uh, we're getting into a lot of data visualization now. Uh, we, have, we have tools that work really well with any kind of spatial data. So if your CSV file has lat long or any other kind of format, uh, we can help you generate the track and maps. Uh, they work in your browser. Uh, it writes files locally. It works with open source and like JS. Um, and you can just go stick this on your website or in a talk. And um, if the internet is not terrible, I should. Um, be able to just run this. Is that built on ggmaps or what is that? It's, it's not built on ggmaps, it's a direct uh, port of the JavaScript library itself. Huh. Um, so there you go, there's, there's an actual interactive map, and you can actually work out the legends and everything else for this data set. Um, we can also um, help you generate chloroplets and other types of maps. So in this case, uh, just mapping uh, crime by state uh, using the violent crime database. Um, and you can animate any variable, in this case we can animate here. Uh, the folks at Plotly are here, and uh, using Plotly, we can actually generate um, standard R plots can now become interactive. And so in this case, you can uh, zoom in and out of plots, um, move the scales around, and actually interact with fairly large data sets as you're exploring um, 
as we explore in data during, during the initial uh, period. Uh, we can do the same thing with scatter plots. Um, again, it's only slow because the internet is slow, otherwise it should be fine. So if you have a lot of points and a lot of overlap, you can actually examine specific regions and embed them in iPython notebooks and anywhere else. Um, but most importantly, we're just helping scientists document their data once they're done and actually write machine-readable metadata and then deposit everything. Um, a few journals that, like FLOSS have started requiring um, researchers to deposit at least the final bit of data that they use to make a publication, and everybody complains a lot because it's time away from research. But um, we've made it exceedingly simple to do that, so people can't really complain anymore. So, uh, Fixture is one of our libraries that talks to the Fixture database, and this is really the amount of code it takes to deposit a data set and get a DOI back. Uh, you create a new object on Fixture, give it a title, a description, uh, what type of object it is, in this case a data set, then attach a CSV file to it, and then upload it, and then you get an identifier returned back to you. So if you analyze your data in R, we've helped you acquire the data, and we've helped you deposit the data after you're done with it. And so um, that's really what we do. Um, we can help you get primary data um, for your research, and we have dozens of packages that get you supplementary data to work with your own data sets. Um, they can go into a file that has Markdown and R, uh, which then allows you to turn this into any number of formats. And then you can deposit these into permanent repositories, get an identifier back, and actually stick that directly back in your paper without any clicking at all. It's all uh, automated and scripted. Um, and so now when people send in research papers, you just see the PDF, and we're trying to make it simple for people to do this and actually have every single component available after they're done without any additional work for them to go back and then uh, make everything be useful. Um, what we're doing right now is aggregating more and more identical data sources into common uh, programmatic APIs. So we can already talk to PLOS, and now we can talk to every single journal that has an API and give you one single interface. Um, Max Ogden has, has been working on DAP, and now um, we're working on a way to actually um, version your data itself and actually capture the hash of a unique version of your data set and stick that back in your paper. So every time you generate a PDF, it will actually have a git commit hash of all the code used at that time to generate the paper, but also uh, the hash of the data itself. Um, we're, we're doing all this um, through funding for Sloan, and if you want a copy of these slides to take a look at, it's all just at that URL. So yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Fields in PLOS, they're all in supplementary data files, or are they also in the tables in the paper? Uh, we can't get to tables in the paper, so any, anything that comes from a journal, we're actually just getting the full text and by querying the fields. Um, so but when you say querying the fields, how do you identify fields? They're just exposed by the API, so we can actually see our results. Oh, you mean they them. are marking our fields? survey data, often survey forms are now designed using like, the XForm standard, um, which allows you to put like input validation stuff in. And have you thought about making it possible to write sort of test cases for data, but also just applying them to input validation? Um, we can do that. So we haven't had a use case for that just yet. But yeah, it's, it's entirely possible. And we've sort of left things open and they're going to test that, but we can do that kind of thing. Um, I think that this upload of the data has a big potential for a researcher to 
basically publish the data before writing the paper. Yeah. Do you know if anybody's doing that apart from me? <laughs> uh, so Julie has a big supporter of our, our picture package. A um, handful of people are doing that, but the time lag between uploading it, so picture allows you to upload data, request the DOI, keep things private until everything is published, and then make it public. But you've already acquired a DOI during this time. Uh, there's a handful of people doing that, um, but there's a long lag between when they deposit and when they actually expose it. But one of the things that we are doing now is when we write the metadata, uh, which again, most of it is automated, you only have to fill in the edge cases. Uh, we're trying to write uh, the creator of the metadata itself to go into Fixture. And so we're hoping that in a few months we can actually query Fixture and see how many uploads came directly from the RFSI package as opposed to somebody manually after uploading the data. And so we're hoping to do that for all of the data providers so we can at least track um, how much usage is coming from our package and how much of it is happening directly. You briefly mentioned testing for outliers. Yes, yeah. yeah. so um, we've, excellent question. We've just implemented a very basic version of that. In fact, it came from uh, folks at Etsy. But um, we've left enough room that people can then uh, customize how they want to look for outliers. And so, it's meant to be a general uh, test case, at the very least, without any further input. But if you actually have a better uh, outlier detection algorithm that you want to use, you can actually include that as an input. So that there's actually like, math involved. Yes. The numbers and, see the and so yeah, so we've uh, there's, we have four different ways to detect it, and so that's what we've implemented right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you.